Does the Bible really predict a future world ruler that would bring together a ten-nation confederacy and usher in the Great Tribulation? Let's talk about that today on Extraordinary Evidence. Our goal is to present concrete evidence for the Christian faith based on fulfilled prophecy. We do it through a perspective of scripture called partial preterism. Preterism just means past, derived from the Latin word praetor. If you look at major events highlighted in the New Testament as coming in the writer's future, like the beast, the apostasy or falling away, the man of lawlessness, the abomination of desolation, the tribulation, signs in the sun, moon, and stars, coming of the Lord, the first resurrection and rapture, the start of the kingdom, the millennium, the battle of Gog of Magog, the second resurrection, the great white throne judgment. Futurists place all of these events in our future. Full preterists see them as all being in the past, and they'll likely conflate or combine the first and second resurrections, along with the coming of Christ in judgment on Jerusalem and the great white throne judgment. They also likely don't see the rebirth of Israel as a prophetic milestone and will likely put the battle of Gog of Magog in the past. Partial preterists like us see some of the prophecies as being fulfilled in the past, but some yet future. We lean towards preterism because we do see the majority of these prophecies as being fulfilled in the past. And there are nuances to each view. Not everyone within each category sees things exactly the same way. We would disagree with futurists because we see them as putting themselves in the seats of the first century writers and their immediate audience, expecting things that were future to them to now also be future to us. We disagree with full preterists mainly about the millennium and events prophesied to come after the millennium. Full preterists seek to find fulfillment of the millennium or the thousand year reign of Christ in the years between the crucifixion and fall of Jerusalem or shortly thereafter. To us, it causes quite a few conflicts within the text, not least of which is shortening the millennium to just a few decades. Now, many have been exposed exclusively to the futurist perspective. And if so, this may sound new to you. But today, let's look at an example, the prophecy of the man of lawlessness, popularly called the Antichrist. Let's see if it's been fulfilled. Most preterists and partial preterists wouldn't use the term Antichrist because it's seen as a conflation of a lot of completely different entities. The beast in Revelation is seen as the Antichrist, but this is really a symbol of the Roman Empire. The little horn in Daniel 8 really symbolizes Antiochus Epiphanes, but is taken to be the Antichrist. The king of the north in Daniel 11 prophesies the line of Seleucid kings, but is put into the Antichrist pot as well. The little horn in Daniel 7 is actually a prophecy of Emperor Vespasian, but that passage is also given to the Antichrist. The willful king, or the king that does as he pleases in Daniel 11, is really the line of Roman Caesars, but in the futurist system that also becomes the Antichrist. So the Antichrist really becomes sort of a proxy for many different things to hold them all together, and all the actions and events and prophecies ascribed to those entities are now given to the Antichrist. One popular teacher says he sees 30 different titles for the Antichrist in Scripture. But are there really? The biblical definition of Antichrist found only in 1 John and 2 John is one who denies Jesus is the Son of God and has come in the flesh. This is the only definition of Antichrist that we're given in the whole Bible. So putting all these different entities under the title Antichrist really doesn't have much scriptural support. Now in our last video, we laid out the case showing scripture places the first resurrection and rapture in the past at the fall of Jerusalem. Today we'll show it from a different angle because you'll see from this passage the man of lawlessness precedes the resurrection. And we'll lay out the case that the man of lawlessness is actually in the past as well. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul said, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him. Gathering here is the resurrection and the rapture, parallel to Isaiah 27, verses 12 through 13, and Matthew 24, verse 31, where he would gather his elect. We saw that in the last video, both passages pointed to the fall of Jerusalem as the time of this gathering. It says that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Now, the point to notice here is the day of the Lord is the day of the Lord's wrath or vengeance on Judea for sin under the law. He's not pointing to anything beyond that passage. The escalation of curses for continued sin under the law would lead to national destruction. 
Deuteronomy 28, 49, the Lord will bring a nation against you from far away from the end of the earth. And that ties directly into the language of the day of the Lord against Jerusalem. Look at Joel chapter two, verse 11. The Lord utters his voice before his army. His camp is indeed very great for mighty is the one, the army or the nation who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. And who can endure it? Look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 17. For the Lord has put it in their hearts, speaking of Rome and their client kings, his army, to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast, Rome, until the words of God be fulfilled. So the Lord was about to bring an army against Judea in vengeance for sin under the law. And the language of being able to stand or endure the day of the Lord was echoed in Revelation 6, verse 17. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Who could stand? The elect or the protected ones could stand. They were the ones about to be spared from judgment and those considered worthy to be gathered to the Lord. Now back to Second Thessalonians, verse 3. No one is to deceive you in any way. For it, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the apostasy or falling away from faith comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now so that he will be revealed in his time. So when Paul says he would take his seat in the temple, it raises three quick questions. Was the temple standing when Paul wrote this letter? Number two, what was the series of events that was supposed to happen in the temple leading up to the day of the Lord? And number three, was there a time in history when all these events happened? So first, was the temple standing when Paul wrote his letter? Yeah, according to scholars, Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians in the early 50s AD, the time of Emperor Claudius. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD under Emperor Vespasian. Paul's audience would have expected him, based solely on what he wrote, to be speaking of the temple they visited regularly. If not, he would seemingly have needed to clarify, not this temple. This one will be destroyed. I'm speaking of a future rebuilt temple, far in the distant future. But we have to remember the day of the Lord he was speaking of was the destruction of Jerusalem, along with the temple destruction. He's not looking beyond the fall of Jerusalem. So what was the series of events that was supposed to happen in the temple leading up to the day of the Lord? So according to this letter, Paul says there would be an apostasy. And Jesus also tied together lawlessness and falling away in Matthew 24, 12. When speaking about the fall of Jerusalem, he says, And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will become cold. So we have an increase in lawlessness. Then we have an apostasy. And Paul says, next, the man of lawlessness would be revealed. And he would take his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now let's combine that with a few other words from Jesus on this. Matthew 24, 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. And also Luke 21, 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Now here Jesus is echoing Daniel regarding the abomination of desolation. And if we look at Daniel 12 verse 11, he says, And from the time the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. So this series of events would be a spark or a touch point that would kick off a 1,290 day period of tribulation. So we have our list of events. Was there a time in history when all these events happened? And did it happen at the destruction of Jerusalem? which is what Jesus, Paul, and Daniel are all pointing to. Amazingly, these events happen exactly when the Bible said they would. This is a model of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus and the apostles. In 70 AD, at the midpoint of the seven-year war with Rome that ran from 66 AD to 73 AD, we had an intersection of all these prophecies. A man named John Levi had barricaded himself in the temple. He was the leader of one of the rival warring factions jockeying over control of the city before the Romans arrived. These factions had even convinced the city to burn the grain supply, telling them God would save them, an example of the lying signs and wonders. Burning the grain supply actually accelerated the famine and made the city that much easier to capture, 
as the people became faint with hunger, just as prophesied in Deuteronomy 28 and Revelation 6. So according to Josephus, the daily sacrifice was stopped on the 17th day of the Jewish month of Tammuz in 70 AD. Now the historian Josephus was an eyewitness to the destruction of Jerusalem. Look at what he says in his book, The Wars of the Jews. And now Titus, who was general over the Roman army and son of Emperor Vespasian, gave orders to his soldiers that they were to dig up the foundations of the Tower of Antonia and to make him a ready passage for his army to come up, while he himself had Josephus brought to him. For he had been informed on that very day, which was the seventeenth day of the month of Panamus, according to the Macedonian calendar, or Tammuz, according to the Jewish calendar. The sacrifice, called the daily sacrifice, had failed and had not been offered to God for want of men to offer it, and that the people were grievously troubled at it, and commanded him to say the same things to John that he had said before, that if he, John, had any malicious inclination for fighting, that he might come out with as many of his men as he pleased, in order to fight, without the danger of destroying either his city or the temple, but that he, Titus, desired that he, John, would not defile the temple, nor thereby offend against God. So Josephus' writing under Roman authority is portraying General Titus as not actually wanting to defile the temple. Now, whether that's exactly what happened or not, we have a record here of the exact day the daily sacrifice was abolished. And it's happening at the exact time Jerusalem is surrounded by Titus' armies, and someone has lawlessly barricaded himself in the temple. John's refusal to surrender ultimately led to the temple destruction, as we'll touch on later. Also, from this point, there were three more years of tribulation for the Jews. This kicked off the time, times, and half a time spoken of in Daniel 7 and Revelation 12, the 42 months in Revelation 11 and 13, and the 1290 days, they're all speaking of the exact same period. Just like Jesus said in Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse, chapter 21, verse 24, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Josephus confirms that this all happened subsequent to the temple destruction. He says, Titus himself grew negligent as to his former orders for killing them, and because the very soldiers grew weary of killing them, and because they hoped to get some money by sparing them. For they left only the populace, and sold the rest of the multitude, with their wives and children, and every one of them at a very low price. And that because such as were sold were very many, and the buyers very few. Fulfilling Deuteronomy 28.68 And although Titus had made proclamation beforehand that no deserter should come alone by himself, that so they might bring out their families with them, yet did he receive such as these also. However, he set over them such as were to distinguish some from others, in order to see if any of them deserved to be punished. And indeed, the number of those that were sold was immense. But of the populace, about 40,000 were saved, whom Caesar let go, whether every one of them pleased. Just as Jesus prophesied, some of them would be spared from this judgment. But let's look a little closer at this John Levi, also known as John of Giscala. Paul said the man of lawlessness would oppose and exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. We've typically read that as he would say the exact words, I am God, worship me. But it doesn't have to be read that way. Colloquially, we might say, look at this guy sitting in the temple acting like he's God. The God of the Bible is considered the Most High God, the true God above everything people call gods or decide to worship, every so-called God. In their day, there were temples to all sorts of gods throughout the empire. He wasn't taking liberties in their temple. He was brash enough to take liberties in the temple of the Most High God, thereby exalting himself above them all. Let's take a look at what he did. All the space round about the temple might be compared to a burying ground. So great was the number of dead bodies therein as might the holy house itself be compared to a citadel. Accordingly, these men rushed upon these holy places in their armor that were otherwise unapproachable, and that while their hands were yet warm with the blood of their own people, which they had shed. They were lawlessly moving about in unapproachable holy places after they had slain their own countrymen. Or look at this one from Book 4. But as for John, when he could no longer plunder the people, he betook himself to sacrilege and melted down many of the sacred utensils which had been given to the temple and said to those that were with him that it was proper for them to use divine things while they were fighting for the divinity without fear and that such whose warfare is for the temple should live of the temple 
on which account he emptied the vessels of that sacred wine and oil, which the priests kept to be poured on the burnt offerings, and which lay in the inner court of the temple, and distributed it among the multitude, who in their anointing themselves and drinking, used each of them above a hen of them. For it, the city of Jerusalem, had brought forth a generation of men much more atheistical, i.e. non-God-fearing, than those that were suffered such punishments. For by their madness, it was that all the people came to be destroyed. From book five, he's speaking of John and his men. He says, you have not avoided so much as those sins that are usually done in secret. I mean, thefts and treacherous plots against men and adulteries. You are quarreling about rapines and murders and invent strange ways of wickedness. Nay, the temple itself has become the receptacle of all. And this divine place is polluted by the hands of those of our own country. Wherefore, I cannot but suppose that God is fled out of this sanctuary and stands on the side of those against whom you fight. And finally, book four. Now this was the work of God, who therefore preserved this John, that he might bring on the destruction of Jerusalem. The day of the Lord Paul pointed to was the fall of Jerusalem. This was the point in time the man of lawlessness was to be revealed, kicking off the great tribulation, and the time the elect were to be gathered to Christ. So I think we can stamp the man of lawlessness prophecy fulfilled in amazing detail in 70 AD. Peace and have fun exploring all the extraordinary evidence. We believe there's a mountain of evidence, so let's start at the base and climb all the way to the top.